Welcome to our Chai Sati Tea Time program. Today, we have a very special guest, Mr. Lincoln McCurdy. Our topic is Turkish Americans and U.S. policymaking. I cannot stress the importance of this topic for the Turkish and Turkic American community. In my many years of experience in the U.S., I have repeatedly seen political involvement as the most important result-oriented, and far-sighted activity for, uh, for communities like ours. Other ethnic groups have comprehended this much earlier and are very successful in promoting their political agenda. In the past, before 2000, our political activities were random. The Turks were most of the time on the sidelines. I realized this with great regret in year 2000. The Armenian genocide claims have taken over the House of Representatives in the U.S. Congress. Intense hearings were taking place. We started to visit Capitol Hill daily and met with individual members of the Foreign Relations Committee. They listened to us and surprised to hear our side of the story, and they said, they never heard our story because they never met a Turk before. This was very hurtful to us. We were very distressed. A few years after that, a finally a major change came around. Under the leadership of Mr. McCurdy, PCUSA PAC was formed. That stands for Turkish Coalition USA Political Action Committee. Regional Turkish PACs flourished. Systematic well-planned activities started to show up around the country. 10,000 Turks campaign started. The Turkish caucus in the House of Representatives reached 155 members, more than one-third of the House that was remarkable in such a short time. He was lucky that we had somebody of Mr. McCurdy's caliber to lead this most important activity. His diverse background in finance, diplomacy, and politics was godsend. Since the early 2000s, Mr. McCurdy has worked tirelessly to bring awareness and knowledge to our community. He traveled widely in the U.S. to educate and motivate many Turkish American groups. Please check the 10,000 Turks campaign Facebook for the activities throughout the country. Brought back wonderful memories. Lincoln McCurdy is an international affairs professional with 40 years of leadership and management experience in the U.S. government, private sector, NGOs, and community fields. Currently, he is a consultant on the U.S. Turkey relations and grassroots organizing. He advises five Turkish American political action committees under the 10,000 Turks campaign and serves as an officer for the Turkish coalition USA PAC. Until recently, he was the president of Turkish Coalition of America, an independent not for profit organization in Washington, D.C. He is currently on the board of Turkish Philanthropy Fund. Prior to this, Mr. McCurdy was the president and chief executive officer of the American Turkish Council in Washington, D.C. Earlier in his career, he worked at the U.S. Department of Commerce, served as the consul for commercial affairs at the U.S. consulate in Istanbul, and was a consultant for the Bank of Boston in Turkey. The U.S. Department of State recognized <clears throat> Mr. McCurdy for his work in enhancing commercial relations between the United States and Turkey, 
In 2018, he was awarded Gusi International Prize Prize Peace Prize in Manila, Philippines, Asia's foremost award for individual efforts attaining peace and respect for human life. In 2019, he received the Turk of America Outstanding Achievement Award in Leadership and Management. He graduated from Hanover College in Indiana and holds an MA in International Management from George Washington University. He and his wife have two daughters and two grandchildren. We thank Mr. McCurdy very much for taking the time to be here. And many thanks to our technical team, Erkan Shahin and SGSR, joining us from Turkey. The podium is yours, Mr. McCurdy. Now, please start from the beginning. Tell us how you got involved with Turkey related issues and how. Did you get involved to lead the Turkish Americans in political activities, which was acutely needed uh, all through the time? Well, uh, thank you, Gloria Hannum, for having me on your program. Um, but before I begin, I just want to acknowledge uh, your great contributions to the Turkish American community, your inspiration for all of us. And it's been a pleasure working with you through the years. Um, getting back to my start, um, it was um, very personal. Um, the very first Turkish person I met um, is now my wife, Layla, and we met at George Washington University. And um, to make a very, very long story short, she made, uh, made a bet that I would never go to Turkey. Um, be, I had, and at that time, I've never been overseas, um, but uh, I was determined to win that bet, um, bet. And I did go to Turkey, and it was in August 1974, right after the uh, Cyprus intervention. And um, I was in a state of shock for the simple reason I realized how ignorant I was. Um, um, Istanbul, when I arrived on this, uh, in Istanbul on the Frank, on the Istanbul Express from Frankfurt, Germany, which took about three days of uh, rail travel, um, I entered a, a completely new world that was totally beyond my imagination. Uh, my whole concept of the um, world was based on Hollywood and movies on um, depicting the, the greatness of the British Empire, etc. Arriving in Istanbul, I realized um, there's a fallacy to that and it really opened my horizons. Um, when I returned to um, Washington, I was uh, working on my master's at the time, and I was um, uh, working part-time with my congressman on Capitol Hill. And in the fall of 1974, Congress passed the um, arms embargo uh, against Turkey, and, and I was in a state of shock to hear the um, basically racist language used against the Turkish people and how one side of the uh, uh, debate was. Um, at that time, um, the Turkish embassy really didn't, wasn't that much involved in congressional affairs. So there really wasn't any voice on Capitol Hill in trying to um, point out the other side of the story to have more of a balanced dialogue. And also, you have to realize, too, that was when uh, President Nixon had resigned. So there was um, a vacuum in, um, um, in leadership on the administrative uh, administration. Um, so um, I was very, very concerned as an American that um, U.S. foreign policy was being dictated by ethnic politics. Um, so years later, I was able to um, join the um, Foreign Service Foreign Commercial Service, and I served as commercial attaché of the Council for Commercial Affairs in, um, in the Istanbul Consulate General um, for the United States government. And it was one of the best jobs I had. And I later, after uh, my government, my um, assignment ended, I worked for the Bank of Boston and helped them to establish their branch in Istanbul. So I spent nine years living in Istanbul. Um, and was able to travel the, throughout the country, the four corners of the country, made a lot of wonderful Turkish friends. And when I, when Leila and I returned back to the States, um, I was very much involved 
in helping to establish a trade association that would promote the commercial interests between the two countries. I um, also um, was involved with the American Friends of Turkey, founded by uh, the late Colonel Ralph Rock. Um, who, and I want to give tribute to him. He realized uh, he had served in Izmir under NATO, and uh, he realized there needed to be a voice. So he basically kind of started the movement of trying to reach out to um, members of Congress and to give the other story. Um, so uh, I'm working with American Friends of Turkey, and then later helping to establish the American Turkish Council. Uh, we got commercial interests. Um, involved in um, lobbying Congress uh, about the Turkish perspective. And that was very, very successful. Um, later, after I left the American Turkish Council, um, uh, Dr. Yashin Ayasla, a very successful Turkish-American uh, um, scientist and entrepreneur who established um, Hittite Microwave in Massachusetts, um, and, and that time was making the most sophisticated microchip in the world, um, wanted to uh, help out in trying to empower the Turkish-American community. And he asked me to help him establish the Turkish Coalition of America. And we had, I think we accomplished a lot. We had a lot of fun um, uh, working with Turkish-Americans, educating them on how to um, reach out to your member of Congress and the importance of having um, dialogue uh, with uh, U.S. government officials, not only on the federal level, but on the state and local level as well. So that's basically everything in a nutshell. Well, uh, but then how did you get involved uh, right after 2000, I think? Was it early 2000? How did you, what motivated you to lead the Turks uh, into the, and have a organized systematic, systematic system for the Turks to connect with the Congress. And what, what motivated you? you? You were frustrated with what, mm -hmm. uh, how much misunderstanding there, are, there was in the Congress. So how did that start and what uh, problems you had and what uh, successes you achieved? And you have a nice set of slides we'd like to see probably. Um, so, Tell us, what did you encounter uh, throughout these activities? Right. Um, there, <clears throat> there were two platforms. One um, was um, educational awareness, and the other one was um, political support of people, uh, candidates running for public office. Now, on educational awareness, when I was at uh, the American Turkish Council, we started having congressional trips for... Um, for staff members on Capitol Hill. And um, that did a lot. Um, whenever an American goes to Turkey, um, they come back um, understanding um, what we've been trying to say. And, um, and we've been doing, um, so ATC uh, was doing congressional trips through the 90s and then through um, even after I left ATC they continued to doing congressional trips then the Turkish once the Turkish coalition of America was established we also did um, congressional trips not only for members but for staff members again as well um, so that was like the educational awareness uh, we did and we did other educational programs which I can um, highlight later if need to be but on the political support, um, one of the things that was a major, major vacuum in the Turkish American community of not being engaged in the political arena. Um, Turkish people who have immigrated to this country have been very, very successful in all walks of life in establishing their careers, uh, establishing a livelihood, their homes, their families, and obviously their first priority was uh, economic uh, security and establishing an economic base. Um, so, and their hearts were still back in Turkey, so they really didn't get involved or were interested in American politics. They were probably more interested in Turkish politics. But um, in, in a democracy, um, 
if you're not involved, if um, you're not heard, so uh, you can't rely on other people to um, speak on your behalf. So the um, Turkish Americans ha have a very important role to play to educate other Americans um, about their homeland, about Turkish culture, and about um, the, uh, the bilateral relationship between the two countries. And yes, you can make appointments with your members of Congress, um, but if, um, if you don't participate like other groups of supporting or opposing candidates um, during the campaign, um, you're really sitting on the sidelines. So we established um, the um, five Turkish American political action committees on uh, the acronym um, known as PACs. Um, PACs are the only legal entity um, that is allowed to collect money to, um, for campaign financing. And um, so this provided um, a vehicle to uh, get Turkish Americans to work together to um, raise money to support those members of Congress, for instance, who are who were willing to um, speak on Turkish behalf, or at least uh, are willing to listen to the other perspective. And the, the um, and the question is, well, why do you have to uh, raise money for their campaigns? Well, uh, members of Congress, uh, it's like a 24-7 a job. They're constantly on the run. Um, they have to deal with all types of um, legislation, you know, taxes, infrastructure, um, health care, um, foreign policy, and their time is very, very limited. Plus, you know, each member of, uh, let's say, in the House of Representatives, each member represents um, roughly 750 to 800,000 people. Um, so, um, how? So, you have to look at it from a business perspective. What's the best way of having um, a um, good discussion and um, being able to explain your case? Um, the other thing you have to realize too. Um, Politics is very personal. It's who you know and who you trust. Um, so if you're helping somebody to get elected, if you help raise money, contribute money to that person's campaign, you get to know them. And, um, and it provides an opportunity um, to uh, um, e explain, to educate um, your candidate about uh, the issues of importance for you. Now. Um, every major corporation in, in this country has a PAC. Now, it's illegal for companies to give money directly to federal candidates, but the officers and employees of a company can form a PAC with the company's name. And, um, and we're, talk we're talking about major companies um, from aerospace to defense to oil and gas to um, telecommunications to automobiles, uh, insurance, giving millions of dollars uh, collected among the employees and officers of that company to um, um, candidates who um, will listen, who um, uh, support their um, positions on legislation, et cetera. So this is part of the uh, American system. Now, the um, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you now have ethnic politics that really started, um, um, well, started right after World War II with Israel, and then um, and then Greek Americans after Cyprus, and then Armenian Americans um, with regard to their issues, um, and they. All these groups raise money and uh, support candidates who uh, speak out for their issues. And um, Turkish, um, also Indian Americans, um, and uh, even Arab Americans um, are involved. And then you have like the Hispanic Caucus of um, Americans of Hispanic uh, 
heritage who uh, have a PAC and other um, and support their own candidates and other candidates who are sympathetic to their issues. Um, so the um, Turkish Americans were basically left out of the game. Um, and one of the, um, as we all know about the relationship between the United States and Turkey, um, it's a very vital relationship. Um, the United States needs Turkey and Turkey needs the United States. Um, unfortunately, um, our, the bilateral relationship has its ups and downs. And, um, and my personal opinion, we're not going to really stabilize the relationship until we have a very strong Turkish American voice um, that uh, makes sure that there's balanced dialogue um, in the halls of Congress. Um, and, you know, let's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, you know, other ethnic groups have elected their um, members of their community to public office. Um, regarding the Turkish American community, there have been only 13 Turkish Americans ever elected to public office, all on the local level. No Turkish American has been elected to state office or to the um, federal government. And we really need to change that. So um, we don't have a um, representative in the quote club unquote. Um, and we need to get Turkish Americans, especially elected to Congress to ensure that there is um, balanced dialogue. Um, let's face it, if you're, if you're not part of the group, people talk against you. If you're part of the group, people are, um, are more sensitive about your issues. And that applies to politics as well. Well, let me ask you, what is the advantage of a PAC versus the individuals giving, uh, uh, supporting their, their congressmen? Uh, I mean, we did that in the past, uh, going to fundraisers where there are hundreds of people and we tried to get ourselves known as a Turkish American and uh, we didn't get that far. I mean, we were a drop in the bucket. So tell us why PACs are so effective uh, in getting uh, us recognized. <clears throat> Well, there's several reasons. Um, when a Turkish American gives a personal contribution, that's important, so I'm not trying to underestimate that. You definitely want to continue that. But um, when a check is received from a, um, a Turkish American, um, how many Americans know Turkish surnames? So um, you really don't know if the, could be Hungarian, it could be Finnish, um, the last name, so you know you don't. That doesn't register. Whereas uh, a check from a Turkish American Political Action Committee, there's no ifs or buts. The uh, contribution is coming from a Turkish American Political Action Committee. The word Turkish is on the check, um, so that um, signifies um, um, uh, the community um, very much. So um, other um, um, advantages are um, a lot of people don't want to be associated um, with the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, but by making a contribution to a Turkish American PAC, and all the five Turkish American PACs are, are nonpartisan, they support both Democrats and Republicans, um, they don't get identified um, with a particular party. Um, so those are some of the, um, plus, and then, um, it's very difficult to raise money, as we all know. Um, so um, uh, an individual may only be able to give um, $500 or $100, whereas a PAC can give a, a maximum of $5,000. So you know you can um, um, get a, a pool of people to reach a 5,000, and it's not a financial burden on 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 one person. Well, I remember once the PAC started, we you used to have small group meetings with the Congress people. And there, we would be 10 Turks or 15 Turks. We could tell each our point of view and have good direct, and all hour we could talk to this 
uh, person. Whereas previously, we would go to those fundraisers. Again, we would be one of the 100 people and, uh, and uh, it really didn't make such an impact. So that was very uh, uh, significant. Those meetings mm -hmm. were extremely valuable. Now, <clears throat> uh, it is very hard to get the Turks involved and be activated. I, mm -hmm. The older generation uh, listens to news from Turkey. Is much more involved with the elections there, with the politics there. Uh, do you see a difference with the younger generation that was studied in the, in the U.S., know the political system much better? Do you see a, a more involvement by the younger generation? I know they're running for office more. But uh, in terms of activity, are they more involved? Do you see a difference? Unfortunately, I don't. But I think part of the reason is, is because of COVID. Um, the momentum that we had established um, um, really um, slowed down tremendously because of COVID. Um, and then the... Um, Sadly, because the um, tensions between the two countries, Turkey and the United States in recent years, um, um, people just didn't feel comfortable um, or participating. Um, and then um, um, you have to say to the, uh, the um, uh, American uh, Armenian lobby uh, became even more aggressive um, in recent years, too, and that turned off, um, uh, scared off, I would say, a lot of participants. Um, I, until we start getting more Turkish Americans elected, um, I think it's, it's going to be very difficult um, to motivate more people. But when we start electing Turkish Americans, especially in Congress, um, They'll have a national platform, and then I think that would inspire more Turkish Americans to be involved. Um, now, they, you know, there have been a number of Turkish Americans who have run for Congress, and um, and we haven't been successful, but at least they're they had the guts and courage in doing so, and we've tried to help them out. And um, I, I, it wasn't a waste of effort. You, each experience is meaningful and you learn something and it lays the foundation for the future. Um, and the, um, you know, we're talking about over 500,000 Turkish Americans, um, um, some, you know, uh, mixed, you know, those who immigrated here, those who were born here, those who come from mixed marriages. Um, um, and it's, um, and the other thing too is, um, sadly, that you know the, the Turkish American community is fragmented. You know, it's very polarized as it is back in Turkey, and that doesn't help in providing unity um, for um, uh, in the political arena. Anyway, can we see some of your slides? I was looking at the Ten Thousand Turks campaign yesterday, and it was so. It had the whole country. And it had every party, both parties represented. There were so many good activities. Uh, let's see your slide now. Okay. Oh, uh, um, yeah, that's, um, I'm on top of the dome of the U.S. Capitol. It has a fantastic view of, um, of, of the city of Washington, D.C. Um, and the only way you can get up there is uh, by invitation um, from a member of Congress. So um, um, this was arranged by con uh, Congresswoman Virginia Fox from North Carolina, whose um, whose uh, grandchildren are half Turkish. Her son-in-law is Turkish, and so she wants her grandchildren to be um, proud of their Turkish heritage. So she's been a very strong voice for Turkish Americans uh, in Congress. So you were on the dome, on the big yeah. white dome, with the statue. Yeah, <laughs> up <laughs> it's there, amazing. yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, let's see the next slide. Well, um, 
Uh, I was on, on one of my congressional trips. Um, this time, Layla joined me. We're t- enjoying a cruise on the Bosphorus passing roommate, roommate Lee Hissar. <laughs> Yeah, they were wonderful. Next slide. Okay. Let's okay. See. This is from another era uh, when I was the Council for Commercial Affairs at the U.S. Consulate in Istanbul back in, and this was in, taken in 1981, spring of 1981. Um, it's in the old consulate building, um, not the new one, in Tepebasha. Which and now it's still owned by the U.S. government, the building, but it's now a hotel. Um, and these are the founders of the Turkish Coalition of American Doctors, Yalçın and Serpil Ayasla, uh, uh, Ali Sabanji, chairman of um, Hergiz Airlines, is with us. Yeah. Um, when I was living in Turkey, I was able to visit all, at that time, um, 77 uh, provinces of Turkey. I think it's been increased to 82, and I think I've been to, I have maybe two more to go, but this is where I've been in Turkey, at least in Western Turkey. You don't see it, the Eastern part. Oh, then um, the uh, Istanbul Chamber of Commerce um, I acknowledge my work um, as commercial officer at the U.S. Consulate in promoting um, U.S.-Turkish and commercial relations. Oh, this is when I was receiving the Gussie Peace um, Prize in Manila, Philippines uh, in 2018. And this is the award itself. Very significant award. And these are um, other recipients from uh, um, from other countries. That we were in the lobby at the hotel at the time. Yeah, so, you know, U.S. Congress has two chambers, the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. And right now we don't have any Turkish American in either chamber. Well, we may get one. Pennsylvania is looking hopeful. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see and what happens. So we have two major political parties in the United States, the Democratic Party and Republican Party. And because of the PAC work, uh, I was able to meet with Speaker Pelosi. Yeah, that's a notorious slide. Yeah, she seems very nice, but you can't get to her head. Yeah. Anyway. But this, um, um, as I said, the PACs are uh, nonpartisan. We support both Democrats and Republicans. And this is when um, Congressman John Boehner was Speaker of the House, Speaker Boehner. And it was the first time that a Speaker of the House hosted a dinner for Turkish Americans. Um, and um, we had the Iosilis there. Uh, um, and then we had um, Congressman Ed Whitfield, the co-founder of the Turkey Caucus, Congresswoman Virginia Fox, Congresswoman Elena ross who at that time was chairperson of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, and then uh, Mutar Kent from Coca-Cola was there. And then Ergun Kirli Kovala uh, from California, uh, representing ATA, was there. Um, this um, my um, coll- uh, colleague Lydia Borland um, and I'm with Speaker Paul Ryan. Now, Lydia didn't work for Turkish Coalition, Coalition of America, but um, she has been uh, uh, the lobbyist for the Turkish Embassy. But she and I work very closely together um, on the Turkish American PACs. I was introduced by Lydia to all those things very yeah. many years ago. Yeah. And this is uh, my granddaughter Mira uh, with uh, Majority Leader, uh, with Majority Leader uh, Steny Hoyer, uh, Democratic Majority Leader at that time. Our, our representative in Maryland. Mm. Yeah. yeah, Maryland, fourth, I think fourth, uh, no, fifth district of Maryland, yeah. yeah. And this is um, um, with um, uh, Chairman Greg Meeks from New York, who's of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Yeah, and we took him, um, 
we took Congressman or Chairman Meeks to Turkey, TCA did, um, on a congressional trip. And here I'm with um, Chairman Neal of the uh, House Ways and Means Committee. On the uh, I remember Meeks was very good in those genocide claims. Mm -hmm. He was excellent. Yeah, Chairman Neal. Yeah. And um, this is um, with um, co founder Ed Whitfield um, of the Turkey Caucus um, with um, Turkish friends. He's still very supportive of Turkey. Yes. There, but both his wife and him, wonderful people. This is um, Congressman Steve Cohen from Memphis, Tennessee, who's currently a co Democratic co chair of the Turkey Caucus. Um, and he's another good voice for Turkish Americans on Capitol Hill. Wasn't he the one whose house was invaded by a pro Armenian photographer yes, or yes. something? And he stood up his ground very well. Yeah, yes. he's, he's amazing. And this is Congresswoman Virginia Fox at her home in, in the mountains of North Carolina. Yeah, we love her. And then uh, Congressman Pete Sessions, um, uh, who was a former co-chair of the Turkey Caucus and probably one of the strongest supporters uh, for Turkey on Capitol Hill today. The Texas Turks did a good job there, I think. Yeah. They were, they were very active. Um, this is where Layla and I are meeting with um, our U.S. Senator, I mean, we live in Virginia, so our U.S. Senator Mark Warner and then um, State Senator uh, Adam Eben. And this is our Congressman Don Beyer. Of our, uh, we live in Arlington. He, he, um, Congressman Byer represents the 8th Congressional District of Virginia. Um, Congressman John Garamandi from California is a very active member of the House Armed Services Committee. Um, we have supported him uh, and we have educated, um, have um, educated him a lot on the issues. He was, he's a willing, he listens very intently. Um, and um, and I think we have, on, with regard to foreign policy, I think we um, have um, helped into, for him to understand the issues better. Um, but being from California, um, you know, we, don't, we can't discuss the other issues. Uh, no one wants to talk about it. Exactly. Or hear about the other side. California is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah uh, Congresswoman uh, Elaine Luria, um, Second Congressional District of Virginia, on the Armed Services Committee. She uh, is a retired um, naval officer, a brilliant um, person, and, um, and we have been able to establish dialogue with her. I remember we did nice mm. fundraisers. Mm hmm. Um, this is uh, Congressman Tom Malinowski from, from um, 7th District in New Jersey. Um, he um, was formerly the head of human rights under the Obama administration at the State Department. So he has a critical um, eye on Turkey. Um, but um, again, he's willing, he understands the importance of the bilateral relationship. Um, on the Republican side, here I'm meeting with um, Congressman Alex Mooney from West Virginia, who's very pro-Turkey. Yeah, he was a state uh, senator in Maryland. In At one time, Utah. yes. He was very supportive of our efforts with the state uh, Armenian resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember him fondly because we visited him practically every day. Yeah, yes. So mm -hmm. Uh, in West Virginia, excellent, very good, yes. And he has aspirations to run for the U.S. Senate, so that would help. <laughs> he wants to run for the Senate? He, he has aspirations to run for the U.S. Senate. 
What about your West Virginia Senator Munchin? Well, I think against him. <laughs> <We're winning laughs> okay. There, there will be. Uh, okay. Oh, he's a Democrat. That's right. Yeah. It gives yeah. Headaches to Biden constantly. Okay. Um, this is uh, Congressman Andy Barr. Um, he's from the sixth congressional district of Kentucky, and it's interesting. He's on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and then the uh, the National Coalition of Turkish American Women PAC had a retreat in uh, Congressman Barr's um, district, which is very, very rural, very conservative, very country. <laughs> um, and um, and uh, Congressman Barr um, came and uh, addressed the, re uh, the retreat participants. And so I find it very uh, ironic here you have a um, uh, congressman from a very um, country district, rural district, as I was saying, um, hosting a um, basically a Turkish event <laughs> in his in <laughs> the district. But we owe that to Ellen Bickelmans, who was uh, running for the uh, state position. Right, right. And uh, she did an amazing campaign. She did. And that is such an important thing. That's how we got to Kentucky. Yeah. Well, Ed, Ed Whitfield was our former connection, but not that close, I guess. But this was very intimate. I but, uh, you know, on the other hand, you know, one thing that's of interest is, um, um, you know, in, in the major cities, obviously, you have a, a lot more diversity um, in um, in ethnic groups. Um, so, um, in Los Angeles, in New York, in Boston, in Chicago, um, you know, Greek Americans and Armenian Americans are quite strong. They've been active for years. Um, whereas, and um, in a lot of the, you know, a great percentage of the population. Uh, is interested in uh, international affairs. You go to the middle of the country, uh, international affairs are not as important. Um, other issues are more important, and you don't have the ethnic diversity as you do in the larger cities. So um, in some aspects, you have um, greater opportunity for more balanced dialogue um, yeah. Yeah, in the middle of the country. Um, so um, like Kentucky, um, uh, is one of them, and my home state, Indiana, is another, um, and um, the Plain States, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very well. At Turkish Caucus had a representative from practically every state in the country, wasn't it? There was one or two that wasn't there, but I think you managed. I think it was um, at the height. It was forty-five. 44, 45, 46, I can't recall, but we're, it, we were a few short. We were very few short um, from all 50. We, we had um, the representatives from the six territories, like Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Guam, um, the District of Columbia. We had, um, uh, they all were members of the Turkey Caucus. Um, and um, this, we, every state in the South was a member of the Turkey Caucus, and I, um, it was New England that was a problem. We didn't we didn't have representatives from like Maine, Vermont, um, and um, Rhode Island, for instance. Those were three states I know that we, it was very hard to get re, um, representatives from those um, communities to join the Turkey Caucus. You had earlier said that um, we had 155 actually. At the peak, we had 162 members in the Turkey Caucus, and we were in the top three um, of the largest by uh, national um, caucuses in Congress. Um, we were competing with the um, U.S. Taiwan Caucus and U.S. India. I, I think um, we were number two. I think uh, India was uh, was the largest, and we were one behind India. Wow, that was amazing. And, Larger and, than and then you. Taiwan was behind us. Mm -hmm. Well, let me let me tell you, there is a lot of activity going on in New England now. Rhode Island is a very good activist, but uh, the uh, representatives are pretty hopeless. But he's working on them, and the task group is doing a great work in New Jersey and New York. 
and uh, so the inspiration is there now the the feel is there the people are educated at the back of their minds people are getting how important this is and uh, so uh, it is uh, it is I'm very hopeful it's slow but it's it's very hopeful yeah, well, go ahead. there are three elements that um, if I may add that are very important um, the two most important elements are votes and money. And you really don't have a large concentration of Turkish people or people of Turkish heritage in any particular area, which can provide votes, can, can deliver votes. Um, the um, Greek Americans have kind of stuck together. Um, Armenian Americans have large concentrations in California, Massachusetts, Michigan, um, and and even in New Jersey. Um, but um, the Turkish people um, have um, are spread out throughout the country. Um, now, for instance, in Texas, you probably have more Turkish Americans than Armenian Americans, but uh, Armenian Americans are far more proactive. So even though they're, they, uh, they're, uh, are, uh, Turks or Turkish people outnumber Armenian Americans, um, they usually lose out politically because they're not as active in Texas. Um, um, and then the third category is basically <laughs> harassment. Um, you know, if you, if you uh, harass a member of Congress, a politician consistently, they usually will go your way just to get you off your back. Now, obviously, that's very <laughs> negative and um, it's damaging the long term, but um, uh, it's been very effective against uh, Turkish Americans. Yeah, repetition, harassment, mm -hmm. very important. You're right, you're right. We have not done that. We are very shy. Very no, we shouldn't do that. Turkish Americans should not be, you know, should not take that route. Uh, sadly, Armenian Americans have done that. They they will harass a member if they um, uh, listen to uh, Turkish American perspectives or have tendencies to support Turkish Americans. They get harassed by at rallies by um, exactly. um, hundreds of uh, thousands of um, emails, etc. Um, and uh, this. We need to be civilized. Everyone has a right to. Yeah, uh, yeah. I didn't uh, mean it. To project their um, opinions, but it needs to be done in a professional, civilized way. I remember the Greeks of Florida attacked Wexler, who was so pro-Turkish, so badly. I remember that. Uh, it, it's very uh, disturbing. But I meant sustain uh, relationship with the congressman. You know, constantly keeping the good relations, keeping oh, yeah. the people sustained, not only once. once sustained, right. Very, very true, Oya. Oh, yeah. um, I'm sorry, we have, I'm slowing the process. Okay, Maybe sure. go to the next slide, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's with um, Congressman Adam Kinzinger, who's been um, very, and Congressman Steve Stivers, both Republicans, very, both of them are retired military officers who understand the importance of Turkey. Oh, other officials. Uh, I had the uh, privilege of meeting um, New York City, City Mayor Mike Bloomberg when he was mayor. This is, you know, later, uh, you know, he became a Democrat, but when he was mayor of New York, he was uh, a Republican. Well, task group is very friendly with Eric Adams now, which I'm very happy they did yeah. campaign, and that's very uh, encouraging. Um, this is with um, former U.S. Secretary of Interior Ryan Zink, um, with um, uh, Mehmet Kadar, chairman of um, TPF. Um, um, Ryan Zink uh, is running for Congress again. Uh, Montana gained a, uh, another okay. and it looks like he'll, he's going to win. That's good, yeah. Um, I'm here, I'm with General, uh, Jennifer Davis, the former Consul General of 
uh, U.S. Consul General in Istanbul, who was very That's supportive. Right. Yeah. Um, then, um, in this photograph uh, with President Abdullah Gul, we, uh, I was leading a uh, delegation of attorneys general from various states. Um, Actually, TCA sponsored two of those delegations, and again, that helped, this was on the state level, but it really helped. Uh, many of these um, attorneys um, were uh, running for, you know, would run for governor or for other officers offices um, later in their careers. So they got to know Turkey, uh, Turkey from uh, these visits. Um, this is uh, a long, long time ago when, um, with Prime Minister uh, Erdogan, when he spoke at the uh, annual conference for the first time at the ATAA annual conference here in Washington. And then um, more recently, um, I'm here with the, um, with Turkish Americans who had run for public office with the, um, JHP or the um, Republican People's Party Chairman Kemal Kilic Darlu. Yeah. Um, then, um, uh, um, as president of TCA, we worked closely with TOB, um, you know, the commodity exchanges of uh, Turkey, and that um, the chairman refought his Sarcikliolu. He was visiting TCA at this time. And um, when um, th this is with Turkish Ambassador Namik Tan, and I helped him to um, arrange a trip for him to visit the state of my home state, Indiana. We're in this meeting with the mayor of Madison, Indiana, uh, one of the best preserved river towns um, in the country. And here I'm with uh, uh, Leila and I are with um, Ambassador uh, Sedar Kilic at um, one of the jazz festivals at the um, jazz concerts at the Turkish residence. The Actually, you wrote that you wrote that from the past. Ertegun and his uh, wonderful activities at the embassy. You brought that up, and the embassy took off with the jazz. Yes, concert. it was a uh, it was a very very good. Uh, uh, activity really and it's still continuing there thank you if i may add a footnote um you know um turkish people played a very significant role in breaking down racial barriers in the nation's capital in washington dc and when um, we all know about alma ertegun the founder of atlantic records um what a lot of people don't realize is that um, the Turkish ambassador's residence in the 1940s um, was, uh, and the 30s, um, was one of the few places, um, probably the, one of the few places outside the White House where blacks and whites could uh, gather together and listen to music. And um, also Alma Ertegun um, broke down, um, organized, the first integrated jazz concert in in, uh, in Washington D.C. and ironically, you know, he had uh, rented um, the National Press Club facility for the concert. But when when officials of the press club learned that he was selling tickets to African Americans, they canceled the contract, and he had to um, hold the event at the Jewish Community Center on 16th Street. Um, so when you, um, so when we started TCA and then the PACs, um, most members of the Congressional Black Caucus um, were probably anti-Turkey um, uh, because lack of information, not knowing and hearing the messages from the Greeks and Armenians about um, their um, perspectives of history. But when, so I was saying, you know, we got to tell them the all met Ertegun stories. And, um, and when they learned about, they knew about all met Ertegun and Atlantic Records, but they didn't realize he was Turkish. 
And then when you um, expanded the story to include that you had concerts in at the Turkish ambassador's residence, um, who in, um, from, um, Duke Ellington uh, um, and Almost, you know, 50 at one time, 50% of the Congressional Black Caucus were members of the Turkey Caucus. So um, we were able to educate them and um, broaden their horizons um, through the Ama Ertegun story. Well, each, each slide tells a big story mm -hmm. in your collection. <clears throat> and um, here, and this, these are the officers of the Turkish Amer uh, National Coalition of Turkish American Women's PAC meeting with uh, Ambassador Marijan. Uh, the, uh, the Turkish American Women's PAC is probably the most proactive PAC of the five. Oh, this is one of um, the few. Uh, reorganized a lot of congressional trips to Turkey, and this is one of them um, where we took a uh, congressional delegation to Ankara to attend the opening of the uh, Jazz Conservatory uh, at Hacettepe University. And in this photograph, we have Congressman Edward Field, Congressman uh, from Kentucky, Congressman Jim Moran from Virginia, who was the predecessor of Don Beyer, and then Congresswoman Donna Edwards um, from Maryland. Um, and, and then we had uh, Maurice uh, Jackson, a uh, professor from um, Georgetown University, who uh, gave a lecture um, about jazz, about the history of jazz at the university. And we um, also um, took a Native American delegation. We took four or five Native American delegations to Turkey. Um, th this, in this photograph, they're meeting with the Minister of Trade uh, at TIM. Um, we had 21 tribal leaders going on this trip. And after Istanbul, we took them to um, Gallipoli. And one of the... Um, um, leaders um, led a, a healing session uh, on the shores, of, on the beaches of Gallipoli, honoring the um, soldiers on both sides of the of the conflict, which was very, very touching and sacred. Amazing initiative. <clears throat> and um, we also worked uh, from. Um, TCA uh, worked very closely with uh, HCBUs, and that's historically um, black colleges and universities. Um, and this is one of, and tribal colleges. So this is one of the trips of, of professors and, um, ac uh, and administrators at, um, meeting with um, a dinner with the um, senior officials of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Ankara. Okay, so PACs, uh, uh, Turkish Coalition of State PAC, uh, Turkish Coalition California PAC, Turkish American Heritage PAC in Texas, National Coalition of Turkish American Women PAC, and National Coalition of Turkish American Lawyers PAC. And as I said, of the um, um, recently, the uh, most proactive um, has been the uh, Turkish American Women's PAC. Women power always there. Yeah, <laughs> and one of the reasons that why they're more successful is that you know they're they're um, you know they're they're addressing universal women's issues, so um, they're able to get their feet in the door. And again, politics is personal, and and when um, so w when you're talking about Turkey and the bilateral relationship. To a stranger, 
there may not be a trust, but when you start building a foundation on other issues, then there's more of a willingness to listen um, uh, about other issues, uh, including the bilateral relationship. Well, the younger generation do that. In a women's fact, the average age probably is what, 40, 45? Yeah, you know, yeah I would that say makes so. a big, big plus, big plus there. And Turkish American women um, have been very successful in, um, um, professionally, um, again, in all um, in academia, science, et cetera. Now, um, in this photograph, for instance, um, these are the um, four candidates who had run for office in recent years. Um, if I may uh, talk a little about each of them. Um, the lady on the right is uh, Aisha uh, Sara, and she uh, ran for city controller, which means um, chief financial officer for the city of um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and she won. And she's the highest ranking um, Turkish American uh, elected official in the country. Um, her budget is 1.7 billion. Um, and um, so um, she's a role model, most definitely. Next to her is Typhoon Selan, and he's also um, county director. Uh, if we can go back to the other slide, previous slide. Um, well, anyway, um, Typhoon, who was uh, standing by her, um, is the uh, uh, commissioner and director of uh, the county of Morris, Morris County, New Jersey. Um, and it's his budget's uh, around a half a billion dollars. So he's um, he's Republican and got elected, and Aisha is a Democrat who got elected. And the uh, other two, um, Helen uh, Gugun Bukemez, uh, had run for the state senate in Kentucky and had a good fight. Um, and unfortunately, she didn't win, as well as Ajlan Kurdulu, who ran for the state senate in Arizona. And um, both of them, I hope, will be running again. In this photograph, um, we have uh, Erem Sarinolu, a, um, a very intelligent, hardworking Turkish-American lawyer who is a public defender in the city of Memphis, and he ran for a judgeship this year. He was endorsed by the mayor of Memphis, who's in the middle of the photograph. Um, uh, Erem um, worked hard. He, un again, unfortunately, he didn't win, but I think he has a very bright future ahead of him. They all got very high votes, though. I mean, it wasn't like uh, a few votes. They got considerable votes, but they came second. Or, but that is very encouraging, I think. Well, a lot of it, you know, if you talk to a lot of members of Congress, they lose the first time around. You know, it takes time to win, yeah. name, um, get name recognition. And the other thing that uh, um, we have to realize um, Americans are not accustomed to seeing Turkish surnames. And, um, and you know, so you have to run, um, you, you just have to jump in the pool and, <laughs> and swim. Um, but, it, you know, some people, it may take two or three times before winning if, you, if you're qualified. And, and I have to say most of the Turkish Americans who, uh, almost all of them, uh, we're very qual qualified, but it's a very competitive field too. Yeah, it's a slow process. Anyway, we should really do this uh, two programs separate because there's so much to talk. Yeah, uh, you know, it is it, it is so relevant to this everyday issues we are facing now. Very much so. And this was at the women's retreat in, uh, in Kentucky in Congressman Andy Barr's district. I'm... Yeah. I think that's it with the slides. That's it, that's it. Well, thank you so much. This is so valuable. Uh, and again, we'll do another program and we'll continue with this. This is so urgent. And thank you. Thank you for your time, Mr. McCurdy. 
and uh, and we'll hope to see you again. Well, thank you very much, Orya Hunnam, for having me, and you have a wonderful day too. Thank you.